Thank you very much for the invitation. I really appreciate this. I really enjoy it. I had a very interesting day today. I expect another very interesting day tomorrow. Tomorrow, and actually, we need fewer photons. We need fewer photons. <laughs> uh, and actually, also yesterday, I had a very interesting day. Sean showed me around the city of uh, 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 Pittsburgh with the bicycle. Um, so that's. The title I gave, it's all about water. The more business-like title would be this one, Ultrafast Infrared Spectroscopy of Solution Phase Molecular System, which sounds kind of boring, and this is why I didn't mention it uh, in the introduction. But in a way, it explains actually better uh, what we do, or what is, so to say, the central focus um, of the work uh, which we do. During this talk today, I will give you, say, three examples of the type of work. It's, uh, you will see, rather diverse. I will start out with uh, work explicitly on water. Uh, the, sec the other two parts are different, as you will see. But strangely enough, and I, I observe this, so to say, myself for my own research, strangely enough, I always end up with water. Um, so that just says that water is important. Um, and that's going to be, so to say, the, the theme of, of this presentation. But as I said before, so to say, our, our core expertise is ultrafast infrared spectroscopy. And I think I, in, in, in front of this audience, I don't have to go too deep uh, uh, because uh, you know all that. Uh, but this is showing the three normal modes of water, uh, how the, the atoms would vibrate. The point I want to make, and this is why vibration spectroscopy is useful for molecular science, is this that we get, get a lot of information out of infrared spectra. For example, certain molecular groups appear in certain frequency ranges. We have uh, chemical selectivity. You can learn a lot about uh, chemical structure of molecules with the help of infrared spectroscopy. Maybe more important in the context of our research is that frequency shifts and line broadenings are observed upon a uh, chemical environment. When we solvate the molecule, it will look different. It will give a different infrared spectrum in an in a understandable characteristic way. And the last point, which is maybe not so common yet uh, uh, in, in a more conventional chemistry uh, community, is that we can also use infrared spectroscopy uh, to measure, uh, to learn about connectivity between certain molecular groups. And this, of course, directly leads into this topic of 2D infrared spectroscopy, which plays a very important role in our, in our research, not exclusively, but it does play a very important role. I come from Zurich, and as such, I have to cite this. This is a citation from a paper from Richard Ernst, which you hardly see down here, in the year 1976. Uh, Richard Hans was the person who invented the very concept of uh, two-dimensional spectroscopy in the context of NMR, and he got um, a Nobel Prize for that. But in this very early paper, he was smart enough to realize uh, that the, the ideas of multidimensional spectroscopy are not uh, restricted to NMR, but they're very universal and in principle can be applied in any spectral range to any spectroscopic transitions. And he mentioned explicitly in this paper also laser infrared spectroscopy. And it became reality about 20 years later after this work. Uh, and in essence, uh, after the development of corresponding sources of pulses, uh, since the phasing times in the, in the vibrational range are much, much faster, we need much, much shorter pulses. Uh, but apart from that, there is uh, uh, very similar ideas behind 2D NMR and 2D infrared spectroscopy. I very often show this view graph to, to, to demonstrate the similarity between the two things. This is a 2D NMR spectrum. This is a 2D infrared spectrum. And on purpose, I choose, uh, uh, so to say, examples where the pictures look almost the same. I will come back to this picture, but I want to use that as an opportunity to explain to you a little bit um, what is two-dimensional infrared spectroscopy. I assume that a big part of the audience here knows about that because you have people here working on that. But still, um, um, so to say, this is my brief introduction into two-dimensional infrared spectroscopy. We generate pulse sequences just like the NMR people work with pulse sequences. There's many approaches to do that. This is the conventional approach, which uh, we and many others also use, where we just have, so to say, many beams, and we have beam splitters and delay stages. And by moving uh, those delay stages, we can generate pulse sequences. Those pulse sequences typically happen on a time scale of a few hundred femtoseconds up to maybe uh, a couple of ten, tens or so uh, picoseconds in, 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 in this range. Um, the prototype 2DR spectrum of a vibrational transition looks like that. 
you can think about 2D R spectrum in essence like a pump probe spectrum, um, uh, which has been done in many other contexts as well, with the one, so to say, addition that the pump spectrum is also, the pump freak, there's also a pump frequency axis which is spectral resolved. And one way of a technical realization of that, and this is actually how it started, um, is that uh, we have basically a pump pulse which is tuned in frequency across a resonance. And uh, on that level of picture, it's uh, basically relatively easy to understand how the spectrum comes about. So whenever the pump pulse is resonant with the zero one transition of a vibrational mode, um, it will excite it. The probe pulse comes a little later after a time, which I will call capital T, often called waiting time. The probe pulse then has essentially two possibilities, either going down back by stimulated emission or going up the ladder from the one to the two level. Um, since this oscillator is slightly harmonic and we need it to be slightly unharmonic, um, these two frequencies are uh, different, in, uh, slightly different, and this gives basically rise to these two peaks um, in a 2D spectrum. So to say that peak from the zero one transition and that peak uh, from the one two transition. Nowadays, but this is mostly for practical purposes, we don't, do, uh, we don't have a narrow band uh, pump pulse which is scanned across the, across the transition. We basically use a pair of two pulses. If you think of that um, in, the, in the frequency domain representation, that looks like a modulated spectrum. And then we scan the time delay between these two pulses which will change the modulation. And in, in essence, we do the same thing, a pump probe experiment, yet uh, we have to basically do a Fourier transform with respect to this, uh, this delay time in order to get back this time of information. But, so I, I would argue this is mostly for technological reasons why that became the, by far more common method of doing it, but conceptually speaking, um, it's not uh, particularly important. So it's conceptually speaking, you can think of that as a pump frequency resolved uh, pump probe experiment. Now let's say we have two, uh, we have a sample with two transitions, we get two of these modes. And uh, one of the first experiments, uh, uh, basically the example I showed you before, is what is, what, what is called an exchange experiment. Now consider that um, um, there's an exchange process. So basically the molecules which uh, at some instant of time happen to be in frequency space here, during the time of the experiment, essentially, during this time, the waiting time, um, they will hop to the other side with a certain rate. Um, and the result of what we would get from that is these so-called cross peaks, um, which uh, appear off diagonal, which basically means we pump the one state and we probe the other states. So whenever such an exchange process is happening, we expect to see those cross peaks. And this is exactly the background uh, be behind this experimental data. NMR and 2DR. Um, the principle is precisely the same. There's nothing different. Um, uh, this is actually a 2D NMR spectrum of, of a lithium NMR. So the chemical system behind that spectra is a lithium ion, which uh, is in an equilibrium between free or being uh, um, complex to this ground ether. In the two states of the lithium ion, it is in a different chemical environment. As such, its chemical shift is slightly different. This gives rise to two peaks um, in the spectrum. But this is an equilibrium. It goes in and out. It goes in and out with a certain time scale. And what we observe is those cross peaks which change as a function of time. So if one were to plot uh, the intensity of these cross peaks as a function of time, we would get an exponential kinetics. And the exponential kinetics one-to-one -one reflects the, the exchange kinetics of that chemical equilibrium. On the left side, precisely the same. The molecular system is, in this case, a phenyl molecule, um, um, hydrogen bonding to a benzene molecule. Also, this is in some sort of equilibrium. So there is a free state and a bound state. Um, and uh, there is a kinetics. Uh, between these two states, um, and as, a set, as such, we see a cross peak which grows in as a function of time. There's two differences between the plots. The one difference is that this is happening on a millisecond time scale, and this is happening on a picosecond time scale. So 2DR can basically look at different sort of time scale. Typically, 2DR is being used to look at very, very fast processes. The second difference is that this has been plotted in black and white, and this is color because that is 20 years older um, than this one, and uh, journals didn't accept color figures at that time. 
A process, which is something I'm going to uh, talk a bit uh, during my presentation, um, which is sort of related, and so to say an exchange process, not between two discrete states, but between a continuum state or continuum of states is what is referred to as speckle diffusion. So let's consider a vibrational transition, which is white in frequency space. And it's white because underneath this band, there's, so to say, many sub-samples in the sense of an inhomogeneous distribution um, of frequencies. Each one of the sub-samples would give rise to this prototype spectrum. And then, of course, uh, when we add all this up, it roughly looks like that. And that is a very typical observation we have in 2 dr spectroscopy. And one example I want to show you, and now I slowly get to the problem of water, um, is uh, a 2DR spectrum of either liquid water or water as amorphous ice. If you were to make an MD simul molecular dynamic simulation of liquid water and just take a snapshot structure at one instant of time, structurally speaking, it would look more, like, uh, more or less like amorphous ice. So I think of amorphous ice as basically a frozen configuration um, of liquid water. Ice, amorphous ice, or a classic state of ice, obviously is very inhomogeneous because each individual water molecule is sitting in a different environment, and the 2DR spectrum represents that. So we get a very characteristic tilted uh, line shape, much like uh, what I have shown uh, uh, you here, and the very, very narrow uh, uh, tilted line shape tells us it's very strongly inhomogeneously broadened. When we look at liquid water, this is more round. It's not precisely round. I will come back to that. But it's definitely more round. Um, um, despite the fact when we look at the 1D spectrum, uh, they are very similar. And in particular, in terms of the width of the spectra, they are more or less the same, which is nothing else but what I said. I started out with saying that the, if you look at it from an um, instantaneous time point of view, Structures in, in amorphous ice and waters are more or less the same. So both are very heterogeneous um, on, a, on a short time scale, um, um, which is represented by this line width. Yet when we look at it with the help of uh, 2DR spectroscopy, we can see a very differ uh, a strong difference. So that is, so to say, making the point that uh, 2DR spectroscopy can tell you much more, so to say, about uh, the sample under study than just conventional infrared spectroscopy. But there's an additional point to it, and this has to do with the fact that, of course, all that will have a time dependence. So that's a, a, a movie of a molecular dynamic simulations of water. Look at, for example, this water molecule. It has a hydrogen bond to the other water molecule, but this hydrogen bond goes on and off uh, simply because it's a highly fluctuating system. In terms of a, mole a potential energy surface of, say, this OH group, um, it will have some shape and it will give rise to some uh, transition. But the other water molecule is, so to say, pushing and pulling on that potential energy surface, and as such, it will change the uh, energy of, uh, of, of the vibrational transition. And the way we think about this in terms of a fluctuating frequency, of a fluctuating instantaneous frequency, so the frequency of the OH vibration is not a given number, but it changes as a function of time. And going back to this picture of an exchange process, so this is how I started out with. If you could look at this problem at, at very short times, it would look like that. But then due to this fluctuating frequency process, so to say a water molecule, say, which was at some instant of time sitting here, will change its position in frequency space. It will diffuse in frequency space, which is why we call it spectral diffusion. And the result of that is that, that this, this, this tilt of the line shapes changes as a function of time. And that turned out to be a very important observable in 2DR spectroscopy. And um, we, as well as many others, have uh, basically investigated this extensively. This is one example, again, in the context of water. Um, that is at room temperature. When we look at the 2DR spectrum at very early times, it's, um, it's slightly tilted because on that sort of time scale, there is a significant degree of inhomogeneity in the sample. And if you follow that as a function of time, you see that this tilt becomes smaller and actually completely vanishes after three picoseconds. Very often we compile that sort of information into this type of plots where we plot the, the tilt, basically the angle of that green line, the tilt of the line shape as a function of time. And for liquid water at room temperature, that decays on the characteristic time scale of one picosecond. 
And you just have to realize that this one picosecond is sort of the typical lifetime of a hydrogen bond. So when one of these water molecules changes its partner, um, it will completely forget what it looked like before. As such, uh, this one picosecond is considered to be uh, the typical lifetime of a hydrogen bond um, in liquid water. What this data is about is that we cooled um, uh, down into the mildly supercooled regime at 260 Kelvin, still liquid water. What we find in 260 Kelvin is that it still decays, but it decays significantly slower, um, mostly because um, we made it colder. Up to this point, I have looked um, at fluctuations of the system or the inhomogeneity of the system on a very local um, basis. So essentially, we look at the OH vibration of one particular water molecule and the hydrogen bond uh, to other water molecules. So we, we, of course, since we have fluctuating hydrogen bond strengths, we will have some sort of inhomogeneity in there, uh, but this is a very local probe of this inhomogeneity. What we were trying to be after is to look at this from a more global sense, to look at hydrogen bond networks. Um, um, these are just example structures from, um, uh, from an MD simulation, like snapshots of local structures around the central water molecule, and they, of course, are extremely heterogeneous. Um, and in homo inhomogeneous, and uh, so to say the goal of the next sub-project I want to talk about, what I entitled 2D terahertz spectroscopy, is to potentially basically see inhomogeneities of that sort with the help of ultra-fast spectroscopy. So we wanted to move into a very low frequency range. We wanted to move in a, a frequency range which is uh, where we find the intermolecular modes of water rather than the inter intramolecular modes of water. So basically, a frequency range when you have two water molecules, they vibrate against each other. And this happens in the frequency range in the case of water below 1,000 wave numbers, uh, which is a not very much explored uh, spectral range. If you look at the absorption spectrum of water in this frequency range, we get three features. Um, at 600 wave numbers, roughly, what is called libration. So this is a water molecule rotating, hindered rotate, rotation. At around 200 wave numbers, uh, we have hydrogen bond stretch vibrations, two waters vibrating against each other. And then there's a shoulder, which uh, one can argue about, uh, which is often assigned to hydrogen bonds. So you need basically three water molecules to think about it, um, some sort of motion of that of three uh, water molecules. Those spectra are extremely blurred, which is a problem with terahertz spectroscopy. Um, so extracting information out of these spectra is difficult or a challenge. From, as a nonlinear spectroscopy, when I see a spectrum as broad, I right away ask my question, uh, myself the question, is what underneath, does it look like this, so that we have three features which are just completely homogeneously broadened, or does it look like this? And we need some sort of spectroscopy to distinguish that, and the spectroscopy we basically set up to do to distinguish that is uh, what we call now 2D Raman terahertz spectroscopy, or um, the question whether we can see terahertz echoes um, in water. You hopefully or probably know the concept of echoes again from NMR spectroscopy um, and that's sort of the textbook picture you would find in any NMR um, um, course uh, what is happening. So essentially we disturb the sample with two pulses. The first one generates a coherence. The coherence decays because there's dephasing because uh, different Spectroscopic probes sit in different environments. And then there's a second pulse which can basically cause a rephasing um, of the system, and that leads to an echo. And the echo appears at a time t2, which is a separation between the second pulse and the echo, which equals time t1. And that's going to be a very important, so to say, feature of all what I'm going to discuss. It turns out that. The language of 2D R spectroscopy or 2D spectroscopy, more generally speaking, and the language of echoes, which is a first sight, looks very different. It's actually not so very much different. The only difference is that the echo language is one which is a time domain representation. And what we typically now use um, um, to represent 2D infrared data is a frequency domain representation. And they are, in a way, trivially connected by a two-dimensional Fourier transformation. These are the data which I have shown you already on amorphous ice. 
uh, which has this very tilted uh, line shape. And what you see here is actually the raw data, which is what the instrument measures, because the instrument works in the, in the time domain. And uh, so to say, if you were to take this data, Fourier transform it back in the time domain, uh, this is how it looks. And it is something which is elongated along the diagonal of this 2D representation. And diagonal means nothing else but this condition T1 equals T2, when this is T2 and this is T1. Um, so a tilted line shape is nothing else but saying it's the frequency domain representation of an echo when we go into a time domain representation. And it turns out that in the terahertz regime, for probably more like uh, historic reasons, a time domain representation is still uh, the more common way of doing things. And this is why I, we do it as well. Um, what this is, is what we now call a 2D Raman terahertz um, experiment. So essentially, we excite the sample twice. We perturb the sample twice, just like in the NMR case. For very technical reasons, which I'm not going to discuss here, uh, we designed a hybrid method where one of the perturbation is a Raman interaction and the other perturbation is a terahertz interaction. Um, but I would argue this is mostly a technical issue. So we excite it twice, and then the sample emits a terahertz field, which we measure and which is a sort of uh, plotted here. In detail, these results are very difficult to understand. Um, and one way we try to look at it is we compare the experimental results to what we call the instrument response function. The instrument response function is what we would get um, as a response, as an experimental observable, if the molecular response would be delta shaped. Um, this is how it looks. It looks already quite complicated. It looks very complicated because, in particular, tera the terahertz pulse we use in this experiment has a rather peculiar shape. So this is essentially the convolution of the terahertz pulse, or I should not convolution, the product of the terahertz pulse uh, with the Raman pulse. Now, if you look at the real experimental results, there's quite a few features which just resemble the instrument response function, in particular what is happening along this anti-diagonal. But then there are features which are beyond that, and the one I'm going to discuss is this diagonal signal. Because again, this is the axis T1 and T2, same nomenclature as what I've used so far. And what would be happening along this diagonal is potentially an echo. I show here, like I compare in the next few graphs, the decay of the experimental data versus that which comes from the instrument response function. This is this plot. The black line is the instrument response function. The red line is the experimental data from water. It's a bit elongated. All that is happening on very fast timescales, a few hundred femtoseconds. After 200 femtoseconds, things are over. It's a bit elongated. And whether you want to call it an echo or not, I put a question mark. Um, um, I would say up to this point that was not clear whether this would be a valid language. But from that point, we decided yeah, let's do something to the water to make it, so to say, artificially more um, inhomogeneous. And one naive way of doing it, we add something to water, and the naive thing to add to water is sodium chloride as a salt at pretty high concentration, I should mention, around 2 molar. Um, that's the experimental data, the 2D uh, IR uh, Raman uh, terahertz spectrum. And this is, again, a cut of the data along this echo line. Uh, the dotted line is from the previous water measurement, and the red line is from water with uh, sodium chloride added. There is a tiny little bit of a difference, and we repeated this experiment uh, many times and convinced ourselves that this difference is real, but uh, certainly this is not a traumatic uh, effect and maybe also not yet very convincing. But then we learned that we have to use other salts, and uh, the one we tried next is strontium chloride. And uh, in this case, the difference is significant. I think uh, everybody would agree on that. And if you look at the 2D spectrum, there is clearly this feature along the echo line. And I think in this case, it starts to become um, um, reasonable to call it like that. Uh, the other example we have is magnesium chloride. Um, um, the feature becomes even, so to say, more pronounced. But there's also actually also opposite examples. For example, cesium chloride, where the, de the decay along the echo line is actually a tiny little bit faster than that of water. Again, the effect is very minor, and we can argue about that, uh, but also that one has been repeated a couple of times, and we find it's a tiny little bit 
faster. What we learned then, so to say, how this, what, what, what is, let's call it the physical origin of that observation is um, related to what is known as the Jones-Dole equation, which basically um, um, characterized different ions in terms of what is called structure making and structure breaking. Um, so there are certain ions which have the tendency to lower the viscosity of water if we add it to it, and cesium is one of those. And then there's other ions which have a tendency to increase um, the um, viscosity of water. And what we found, if we basically just take the fitted decays of these, uh, correlation, uh, of these uh, echo decays, that they correlate perfectly with what, which is what is called the B coefficient in this uh, uh, empirical equation, uh, where the empirical equation describes the viscosity independence of the con concentration, and the B coefficient is the linear term uh, in this equation, which is the most relevant one in the concentration range uh, with which we work. So we see a strong correlation, which I must admit at this point uh, we don't fully understand um, uh, from a microscopic point of view. Uh, but nevertheless, this observation connects a very macroscopic observation, namely viscosity, to a very microscopic observation, namely uh, terahertz spectroscopy, and in particular the ability of terahertz spectroscopy to see echoes which are related to a certain extent, or must be related to a certain extent, um, to the like, distribution of structures in the low frequency uh, regime. What is also plotted here is the on-axis decay. So, so to say, um, if, you, if you look at this one, uh, the one is the decay in, in the echo direction and how it changes with salt. And the other one is the decay along this axis and how it changes um, as a function of the salt. We see that the approach it does is magnesium. And this is sort of saying that latest in the case of magnesium chloride, it's correct to call it an echo because the echo signal lives, lives longer than, in essence, the uh, free induction decay along one of the two, two axes. We also try to understand these results from a molecular dynamics point of view, um, and that also turns out to be quite tedious. It turns out, in order to be able to describe uh, uh, these uh, signals, we need to consider polarizable water models. Uh, for the trivial reason, for example, that it includes Raman interactions. Uh, we tested a set of polarizable water models. Uh, we started out with TIP4P 2005, which per se is not a polarizable model, but uh, in order to calculate the spectroscopy, we basically added just for the calculation of the spectroscopy polarizability uh, to the system. And then two um, intrinsically polarizable water models SVM4 NDP, which is uh, probably one of the more common ones uh, known in the community, and a, a, a model which is not quite well known yet, uh, coming from the group of Paul Tavan. He, he gave it the name TL4P. There's two points I want to make. First of all, if you look at these responses, they are completely different. Um, I mean, if you look compare this one with this one, actually it changes colors. The colors depict the sign of the signal, so it completely inverts the signal. Our conclusion is that 2D Raman terahertz spectroscopy is super sensitive on the polarizability of a particular water molecule, and as such should be used, in my opinion, as a test of polarizable water mole mole uh, models. And the second point I want to make from all these models, uh, when we compare it to experimental results, it's actually this one, which is not widespread in the community yet, um, which sort of semi agrees with the experimental results. It's not perfect, certainly not but it's certainly the best agreement uh, we, we get with experimental results. And if you're interested, I can tell you what is, so to say, special about this particular model um, um, later on. With that, I come to the second part, which is something completely different. Uh, so if I lost you up to now, it's time to wake up again. It's something completely different um, about water splitting, water. This is something relatively new we started. Uh, it runs under the word uh, artificial photosynthesis. Uh, the idea of um, artificial photosynthesis is to construct a smart molecular system which allows to split water by the absorption of light. Um, and obviously, I mean, this is a very fashionable field. Uh, every, everywhere on Earth, uh, people work in this direction. Um, um, obviously, if one can get this to work, it could make a tremendous impact 
in uh, uh, problems uh, we have in terms of our uh, energy consumption. Um, so there is huge um, efforts in trying to find a system which does that. From a very, so to say, gen general perspective, the idea people currently have how something like that could work is depicted here. So we have a molecule which is called a photosensitizer, which absorbs light and brings that molecule in an electronically excited state. And that, uh, sorry, in, a, in an electronic excited state, and that is being quenched by taking up an electron from what is called the uh, water oxidation catalyst, and this electron is, so to say, shuttled onto another catalyst, the water reduction catalyst. Um, and on the right side of the reaction, we produce molecular hydrogen, which is the desired molecule out of protons. And on the left side, as a side product, it's a needed side product, it's but not wanted. It's actually the more difficult step. Um, on, the, on the right side, we oxidize water and produce molecular oxygen. And nature sort of does the same um, in photosynthesis, and this is how nature produces all, or basically all, of its energy. The nice aspect about this is that the two, uh, uh, side, um, the two um, uh, reactions can be split, and also, also in nature they are being split, and as such, uh, much of the research also tries to split uh, these two uh, reactions, and this requires that we add to the system what is called an sacrificial electron donor, which for now is just done um, as, a, as a construct, in the long run, this will not save the world, but this is a way, basically, how we can study one of the two half reactions separately. And there's concepts which also would do this um, on the other side. We concentrated so far on the water reduction side. I should mention that this is a very close collaboration with uh, somebody in inorganic chemistry at the University of Zurich, Roger um, Alberto. So they have developed or they have synthesized two particular molecules for uh, this purpose which are rather good in terms of their performance. So they use this uh, metal carbonyl, radium carbonyl, as a photosensitizer and a particular cobalt um, complex as the water reduction catalyst. And we joined into this, mo and in this product, project trying to contribute um, to, to, say, to solve the mechanism of this reaction. We started out with the photosensitizer, which is the simple part. Uh, metal carbonyls are the dream of any infrared spectroscopist because they give uh, very strong infrared bands and for, uh, even more so, um, these vibrational bands shift in a very characteristic way and beyond any doubt into certain directions depending whether the metal center is being oxidized and reduced. So we can do transient infrared spectroscopy on the rhenium uh, carbonyl and just to basically guide you through the spectra we start out with rhenium in its rest state, we excite it, and the, excite the, the absorption band is a metal to liquid charge transfer, so basically this is a formal oxidation of the rhenium center, and it turns out that an oxidation causes a blue shift of all the vibrational bands, which is what we observe. Then comes this sacrificial electron donor, it quenches the excited state by transferring an electron, so basically it reduces the rhenium, and a reduction causes a, a red shift, of all the vibration bands, which is what we observe after some time. And then comes the electron transfer step to something, and the something is the cobalt catalyst, uh, and as a result of that, the rhenium goes back into its rest state, so the signal uh, disappears. The way how we know it's the cobalt catalyst is because um, the rate of this step depends on concentration cobalt. So these are second-order processes, um, so when we vary the concentration of the cobalt uh, catalyst, um, the rate of this, this, this step becomes faster, and this is how we know it goes to the, to the cobalt. And starting from this point, at some point magically it produces hydrogen, uh, and this is actually the much harder to study process, uh, and it is particularly much harder since that doesn't really give us very good um, um, infrared marker modes. And the other point which makes it, conceptually speaking, a difficult to understand problem is the very fact in order to produce molecular hydrogen, we need finally two electrons and not only one. So it cannot be as simple as what is plotted here. We need to accumulate uh, two electrons, and that makes the reaction difficult. And that's actually the reason why the oxygen side is even more difficult, because for the oxygen side, we need actually four electrons to be pumped around and not um, only two. 
So we didn't manage to look at the follow-up with the help of infrared spectroscopy, and this is the only and first time when I switched to visible or optical spectroscopy. So we basically constructed a flash photolysis experiment uh, to look at uh, the oxidation states of cobalt, because it's of course so that the optical spectrum of these metal centers uh, can change quite dramatically in dependence of uh, oxidation state. Um, I don't have the time to go into all holy detail. We measured essentially in a frequency range around 600 nanometers. We see a characteristic band which comes from cobalt-1, and we see very detailed kinetic responses, very rich uh, kinetic responses. Please note that this is many orders of magnitude in times, from microseconds up to actually hundreds of seconds. Uh, we measured that in dependence of the amount of light and in dependence of the pH. The reason why these two parameters are important is uh, because, in essence, what has to happen is um, that the cobalt center gets two electrons on the one side, and it also gets two protons on the other side in order to come to the final product. And the question about the reaction mechanism is basically what is the pathway through these sort of diagrams. The only way how it can get two electrons is by uh, bimolecular reactions. So basically two of already reduced uh, cobalt uh, uh, catalysts have to meet each other. So it makes it uh, a, a bimolecular reaction and as such the amount of reduced cobalt catalyst changes the kinetics um, of the process. So we try to essentially globally fit all these observations and from that we came up with a very, very detailed um, um, reaction cycle, uh, which includes the rhenium part, which is the trivial one, which includes the cobalt part, which includes, for example, the, the step where two, part, two already um, reduced cobalts meet each other and generate, as so to say, the final reaction uh, reactive species, cobalt 2H. And actually, it also includes the sacrificial electron donor, which is a necessary part of the reaction, even though it's the not, I mean, in the long run, not uh, the uh, needed part, but for, for the time being, we need it. And it turns out that the follow-up chemistry of the elect uh, sacrificial electron donor is quite complicated and in some instant of time actually complexes also uh, to, the, to the cobalt catalyst. This is, let's call it a nasty side uh, reaction, which caused us a lot of trouble to try to understand it. Uh, but we propose that at some instant of time, um, it complexes um, to the cobalt catalyst as well, which causes some of the uh, kinetic steps we had seen um, in the transient um, data. All that was done in solution phase so far. So this is what runs under the name homogeneous catalysis. Solution phase is nice because uh, it's reasonably well um, characterized what the molecular systems are. And also because the spectroscopy is comparably simple. But I think it's fair to say, and this is something I learned in this project, that a solution phase homogeneous catalytic system will never work. It will not save the work. Once we would, uh, would uh, combine the water reduction side with the water oxidation side, there's too many redox active species in the solution. Uh, you cannot avoid side reaction. You cannot avoid shortcuts. Uh, it will not work. And uh, I think the best reason why I say it will not work is because also nature didn't manage to work. Um, in a solution phase environment, in a homogeneous environment, nature loses, uses uh, membranes to structurally organize these systems. And as such, I think it's pretty clear that in the long run, uh, we will have to do this as well. So I decided at some point that we have to learn how to apply all our complete tool set of spectroscopy um, on surfaces. And uh, uh, what is going to come now is our efforts in this direction. I should say from the beginning that uh, we have not yet managed uh, to look at um, um, a, a, a catalytic system at surfaces. Uh, but uh, what, what, what I'm going to talk about is, so to say, learning steps in this direction. What we have done recently um, is to combine the concept of 2D IR spectroscopy, which I introduced to you at the beginning, with ATR spectroscopy. ATR spectroscopy. Uh, in conventional FTR spectroscopy is pretty standard, uh, pretty useful, but the combination of both of these techniques so far hasn't been done, which is a bit surprising. In essence, what this is about is we have a prism. We coat this in most cases with some layers. In this particular example, a gold layer. 
Uh, we have our pulse sequence, which does the 2DR experiment. It comes from the back um, onto the prism. And then what's happening, because the index refraction of the prism is larger than the one of the environment, um, uh, we get total reflection. Um, and there's a little bit of what is called the immanescent wave leaking into the medium. And that measures essentially the molecular species which are immobilized um, on that surface. The penetration depth of this immanescent wave is rather small, about a micrometer. It's not truly surface sensitive, uh, but uh, it's um, uh, about a micrometer. And as such, it avoids or it reduces any background absorption from a solvent um, dramatically. So we can now easily measure. Actually, it's not a particular difficult experiment. We can now easily measure whatever we put um, on the surface, whatever molecular species we put on the surface. And we started out with um, um, self-assembled monolayers, which have like spectroscopic reporter groups at the end. And one of the possible reporter groups is an, is an azide group, which gives us a very distinct band at around 2,000 wave numbers. Um, and we looked at, so to say, spectral diffusion again in the, context, in the sense of what, how I introduced it. Um, of such self-assembled monolayer. And this is just one of the examples we have many by now. In this case, it shows uh, a, 2D, a sequence of 2DR spectra of either the molecule in solution, in bulk solution, that's the blue data. Um, um, and this is related to the corresponding 2D spectra. In this case, this is hardly inhomogeneous. So this is, again, plotting the line, the tilt of the line shape as a function of time. If you put that molecule into solution, there's a tiny little bit of a tilt, which decays very quickly on a picosecond time scale. So in solution, in bulk solution, it's hardly uh, inhomogeneous. But once we have it on the surface, A, these line shapes become uh, much more tilted, much more inhomogeneous. And B, the decay of these line shapes, the time scale of speckle diffusion, uh, become uh, significantly longer. Uh, what is in the background of that is, again, so to say, the interaction of um, um, uh, molecules and surfaces which is with its environment, which can be other molecules, or it can be also the solvent, uh, which is being used in simulation. I have, uh, in the experiment, I show you here basically some preliminary results of an MD simulation of this sort of problem. So that uh, shows you the, 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 the setup, a gold layer, and a small molecule with an azide group as a reporter group. And what is on the right side is um, like a, a, a MD simulation of this, this problem. And I cannot say that we have analyzed this really at this point, but I just want to make the point that, of course, um, this is a dynamic system as well, just like liquid water. Uh, but at least from the experiment, it's, it's of course significantly slowed down uh, once we put it on, on the surface. So um, I think this is a very good experiment to learn about how solvation happens in surfaces. It's slowed down. Basically, implicitly, this says how a solvent or how any molecule which is inside the solvent can potentially access molecules um, on a surface. The other um, approach we chose is we couple this experiment with an electrochemical cell. So I told you that we can sputter uh, coat uh, the surface with materials, either metals or in this particular case actually ITO as a conducting uh, layer. And we can use that layer as the um, working electrode of an electrochemical cell. In this particular experiment, we put just uh, a simple CO molecule on small nanopart uh, uh, platinum nanoparticles, which are in addition to that on that layer. Uh, and what I show here is, again, 2DR spectrum of the CO molecule. And we can do this now in dependence of the uh, electrochemical potential which we apply uh, to this electrochemical cell. Um, the first observation, which is sort of the trivial observation, is we, we get a frequency shift in dependence of uh, voltage. So this is frequency in dependence of the um, applied potential. There's a linear frequency shift, which is basically some sort of Stark effect and this is uh, known because that you could also measure with, of course, 1D uh, spectroscopy. But again, we have this tilted line shape, and we can follow how the tilt of the line shape decays as a function of time. Again, relatively slow on a, some 10 picosecond time scale, which is uh, relatively slow for spectral diffusion. But what we find sort of surprising is that this hardly depends on the applied voltage. Uh, so the one piece of data is that uh, 
um, 0.4 volt, and the other piece of data is at minus 1 volt. Um, and the spectral diffusion time, so to say the solvation of the CO molecule on the surface, hardly depends on that, or basically does not depend on that, which we find surprising because after all we apply a potential and you would imagine that this sort of changes the ordering of water around the CO molecule, uh, but apparently the effect is too, uh, too little uh, to see. And the third project I want to talk about it, yet something completely different, has to do with proteins and has to do with the very, con uh, the very problem of what is known as allosteric uh, regulation or allosteric uh, dynamics. So this is the textbook description of what is called allostery. Um, the, the, the concept of allostery describes uh, the observation that there's very, ma very many protein systems which have, say, two binding sites. One would be the enzymatic site of an enzyme, which is where the, the, the protein does its action. But the activity or the um, um, Binding affinity of a substrate to the enzymatic site depends on the question where, whether something else binds to another site, the allosteric site of such a protein. As such, I call that um, problem of allosteric the molecular transistor. So essentially, there's the one part of a protein which does the action, but there's a knob which can ten, turn on and off the action. It can change the activity um, of the enzyme. This is a very crucial process for all living system, um, and it is not really understood on a molecular level, and uh, we wanted to apply, so to say, our tool set of techniques to try to contribute um, to an understanding of that model from a, a problem from a very microscopic point of view. So we constructed a molecular system <coughs> based on a particular allosteric protein, the so-called PDC2 domain, which binds a peptide as a ligand, and it changes the conformation upon the binding of a peptide, and this is what's shown on the right side. So the right side shows you the X-ray structures of this particular protein called the PDC2 domain, and the red X-ray structure is the one where the ligand is bound, and the blue one is the one where the ligand is not bound. And if you look very carefully, it has this binding groove. If you look very carefully, once the ligand is bound, the red structure the binding groove is a slightly little bit larger uh, than without it. So it comes very close to these textbook pictures. Once we have something bound to the protein, the binding groove becomes a little larger, so we induce the binding of something, induces a structural change um, in the protein. And what we set out to measure is, so to say, the dynamics of the protein when it changes the structure going from here to here. So in, in a sense, so to say, we wanted to measure the switching speed of that uh, molecular transistor, of this uh, biological uh, transistor. And what we chose for the time being as a way to do that is an artificial construct. So rather than binding a ligand and observing um, um, the conformational change of the protein, we needed something which we can light trigger. And uh, the construct we came up with is we cross link the binding groove with a molecule, a small organic molecule, azobenzene, which we can cis-trans isomerize with the help of light. So we linked, covalently linked, this azobenzene molecule to the protein in a way such that in the one state, the trans state, which is this one, the trans state of the azobenzene, um, the binding groove is a little larger, and in the cis state of the azobenzene, the binding groove is forced uh, to be a little smaller. So we have a way by that to photo-trigger the process, uh, to perturb it with a light pulse, with a short laser pulse, to photo-trigger the process, and then look with the help of infrared spectroscopy uh, how the protein responds to this local perturbation. As a starting point, we did NMR, structure analysis of our artificial construct, so this is, again, the native system where, where the conformational change is uh, initiated with a li by ligand binding. And this is our artificial system where the red structure is the one where the azobenzene is in the trans configuration and the blue structure is the one where the azobenzene is in the, in the cis configuration. <clears throat> and uh, at least qualitatively speaking, this resembles the native system reasonably well. Please notice that... Uh, the conformational change is very, very small, so the effect of the azobenzene is actually quite little. 
uh, uh, but it is, say, equally small as it is in the native um, system. We can use infrared spectroscopy to distinguish essentially the two states, cis and trans. Uh, for the purpose of this study, we look at the so-called amid one band. The amid one band is basically the CO vibration of the peptide backbone of the protein. Um, this shows the amid one spectrum of the protein in either one of the states. The changes in the spectrum are very, very small, but there are tiny changes uh, in the spectrum, which you see down here. These are different spectra. So this measure the infrared spectrum in this state minus the infrared spectrum in this state, or vice versa in the opposite direction. Uh, the green spectrum is the cis minus the trans, and the red spectrum is the trans minus the cis. Those are mirror images from each other, and this basically tells us that this conformational switching um, is re re reversible, and we actually can do this back and forward switching hundreds of times, thousands of times. This is absolutely reversible um, and absolutely uh, uh, stable. And it is just so, without, we are not able at this point to talk about details. We don't know what this means uh, in detail, structurally speaking, but it is clear that the amid one spectrum responds to the structure of the protein. And as such, uh, we have, so to say, a qualitative handle on um, this, this response of uh, the structural response. And with that, we started to do time-resolved uh, uh, time infrared spectroscopy, transient infra infrared spectroscopy. Again, note the logarithmic time scale. So this sta starts at picoseconds and it goes up to many microseconds. The green data come from one particular vibration mode, which is sitting on the azobenzene. So it's very local. Um, it's basically representing, um, this is what we believe at this point, the binding groove. Uh, it takes about 100 nanoseconds when we do the photo switching. It takes about 100 nanoseconds for the binding groove to respond um, um, to this perturbation. 100 nanoseconds for it uh, to open. The red data come from the amid one band. Uh, we see that the amid one, amid one band also changes on this 100 nanosecond time scale, but it keeps on going on a much, much slower time scale up to tens uh, of microseconds. So in a way, we believe, even though we don't yet know in a structural sense what this second phase is, which is a microsecond phase, but I think it's reasonable to assume that this is sort of the allosteric response. So to say, this is the local perturbation happening on a 100 nanosecond time scale, and the protein on a longer time scale uh, responds to it um, um, later on. We did a lot of MD simulations to try to understand this process. And I start with the very early process uh, within the first one picosecond. Um, that is a snapshot structure where the azobenzene is still in the cis configuration. This is the structure of the protein. And uh, this little movie, which in real time is, as I said, one picosecond, um, shows what's happening, so to say, at the very moment of the isomerization. And what I want you to focus on is essentially the central um, and end bond of the azobenzene. When the movie starts again, here's in cis. And then, so to say, when I start the simulation, this is mimicking the absorption of a photon, initiates its cis-trans isomerization. Um, and what um, I want you to see is that the central and end bond rotates around right away, within, say, 100 femtoseconds. But initially, the, the azobenzene was still bent. So it is, in terms of its electronic structure, already in trans, but with a lot of strain um, in the system. And it takes about, one more time, it takes about a picosecond. Why is this no longer working? It takes about a picosecond until the strain within the azobenzene is being released um, and basically transferred uh, to, the, to, the, to the protein backbone. The next move is, so to say, what's happening afterwards, um, and that is now going on over a time scale of 100 nanoseconds, and this is happening on a logarithmic time scale. So actually, each frame, um, each 
order of magnitude in the movie is going to be 10 frames. Um, and this is what's happening, so to say, as a follow-up, as a response of the protein to this azobenzene switching. The azobenzene is still there, it's just not shown in this movie for, for clarity. And uh, so you see the flash, and then you see very little. You have to look very, very carefully to see that after the flash, um, the width of the binding groove changes, and this goes on uh, for 100 nanoseconds. So it takes about 100 nanoseconds uh, until this is happening. But structurally speaking, very little is happening, which is in a way anticipated because I said from the beginning that the structural change induced by the azobenzene um, is very little. The next plot uh, makes this a bit more quantitative. This measures essentially from the MD simulation the distance of the binding groove as a function of time on a logarithmic time scale. The red data are uh, these two points, and this is actually the points where the azobenzene is directly being attached. Um, you see that within the first one picosecond, uh, this makes a little jump of about one angstrom, uh, and this is essentially by the brute force we, we apply by the azobenzene, and then it keeps increasing um, so the protein keeps relaxing, so to say, uh, upon this uh, perturbation. It keeps increasing up to roughly 100 nanoseconds. So for this particular MD simulation, we stopped at 100 nanoseconds. Um, the process is not quite finished yet after 100 nanoseconds. From other MD simulation, we believe it takes on up to uh, one microseconds. The plots down here measure the distance of, 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 of this distance and this distance. Uh, we see essentially none of the in initial jump. But, uh, so to say, the later on part um, is more or less the same as here. So we can tentatively um, uh, reconstruct uh, what we have seen in the experiment, experiment that the opening of the binding group is happening on a 100 nanosecond time scale. Now you might ask, where's the water in this project? And this is the last transparency I have. <coughs> um, that's the same MD simulation. Uh, just looking from a different side. Again, the movie which I'm going to show you in total is uh, 100 nanoseconds. Again, on a logarithmic time scale. And what I'm plotting now in addition to that is the water solvating the protein, or I should say is the amount of how the water density changes um, around the protein. So every red plot means that the average density of water at this particular position is larger, and every blue plop means it's less. So it's like different water uh, density. What you see is that the biggest part is happening around here, which is not surprising because, because here's the most action, because here um, um, we have this isomerizing azobenzene, which changes structurally quite a bit, and as a result of that, there will be new voids, or there will be parts which are no longer be uh, populated by water, and as such, the biggest change in water density is happening around here. What I want you to see as well is, however, that um, um, when we look at the backside of the protein, so to say at the side opposite to the perturbation, there's also a change. Something wrong here. And what I find extremely intriguing is you can observe some sort of propagation pro uh, uh, process. So here's where the per perturbation starts, and the perturbation of water solvating the protein propagates around the protein, and it takes roughly 100 nanoseconds to reach the opposite side. I must say I don't yet understand why that is so, and also I'm not sure whether this is of any relevance. But it, I find it very intriguing that we see this propagation effect uh, around the protein, and we're sort of proposing that this might be a mechanism of allosteria in the sense, despite the fact that the structural change in the protein is really minor on this level of movie, you basically don't see it, even though there is a small structural change. Um, this small structural change is sort of amplified by the water solvation around it, um, and that sort of changes, of course, also the polarity um, of, of, of the protein surface, and uh, we sort of suggest that this is a mechanism of allosteric. So with that, I'm done. I'm not sure how I'm doing in time. I've shown you a little potpourri of, uh, so to say, the work uh, we do. I've talked about, um, where is it, the structure of water. 
I've talked about artificial photosynthesis, protein dynamics. We, a strong side or an important side of our uh, work is developing of spectroscopy. Uh, 2D Raman terahertz is one example. 2D ATR spectroscopy is another example. 3DR spectroscopy, I haven't talked about it. Uh, this was uh, actually the work of Sean when he was um, in Zurich. Um, so big part of our work is also the development of new uh, spectroscopic tools and then use them to apply uh, to different problems throughout uh, all sort of uh, fields of molecular sciences. This is not the most recent uh, photograph of the group, but it is uh, basically all the people who contributed to the work I've been discussing about, or most of the people, not all of the people who contributed to the work I've been discussing uh, today are on this photograph. This is a list uh, of funding agency. And the last comment I wanna make is, um, oops, something mixed up here. I don't have that. Um, I actually changed the title of my talk tomorrow. Uh, some of you might have realized, uh, some maybe not. So my talk tomorrow is going to be, the title is a, a Markov state model of the two-state two behavior of water, which is something very recently uh, we have done um, from a theoretical point of view, trying to understand what is the structure of water, trying to learn how to describe uh, the structure of water. I think... Um, this is going to be inspiring. It's probably a bit provocative, and this is why I thought I want to present it here. So thank you very much.